come and worship people of God. For our God, the Most High, is seated on his holy throne, sovereign over all the earth. Let's worship God together. Let's sing. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Welcome to Redeemer Christian Church's online service. We're so glad that you have joined with us today, and we would love to stay connected with you. Some of the ways that you can do that is if you have a prayer need, or if you have any need in general, we would love for, to hear from you at contact at RedeemerChristianChurch.com, or you can text us by using the number that's on your screen. A couple other ways that you can stay connected throughout the course of this week is that our gospel communities are still going on, and they're uh, happening in a digital format. And so you can find out more information about that by visiting us online at RedeemerChristianChurch.com slash community. Well, two other ways that you can get connected with us today is that right after this service, we'll be have, hosting a digital foyer for you to meet and hang out with staff members and other members of our congregation and get to know one another and talk about things that are going on in your life. And also, we're going to be hosting an elder-led prayer service tonight at 6 p.m. The links to both of these Zoom meetings are in the description below. Now, please join us for the reading of God's Word. Welcome. 
My name is David Ritchie, and I serve as lead pastor of Redeemer Christian Church. Our mission is to declare the gospel of Jesus Christ with our words and to display the gospel of Jesus Christ with our lives to our neighbors and to the nations. And how that mission looks has changed in these last few weeks due to the global pandemic, but that mission goes forward nonetheless. This last week, we were privileged to be able to help some of our members financially that have been really undergoing some stress and some financial need in this time. And we want you to know, if you have a need in this time, it's our desire to be able to help you and to serve you in this season. You can visit our website at redeemerchristianchurch.com help, and you'll find there a form that you can fill out and tell us about the nature of your need. Um, we really do want to be able to um, come alongside one another in this season and, and to be able to be there for those of us that are in need. As I prayed for our congregation this week, one set of verses I've consistently come back to is the book of Acts chapter 4. Now, the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul. And no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them. I really do hope that when we come out of this season of COVID-19, that it can be said of us that there was not a needy person among us. And so if you are right now privileged to be able to have a job and resources, and you want to be able to help those that do not have, I want to encourage you to just continue giving to the general fund of Redeemer Christian Church during this time. You can give online at RedeemerChristianChurch.com. You can also mail a check to our physical address at 3701 South Sauncy in Amarillo, Texas, zip code 79119. This is still a season where we want to dedicate ourselves to testifying to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. We want to declare the gospel and we want to display the gospel. We want to do that with our words, but we also want to do that with our deeds. And so with that in mind, I'd like you to turn your attention to the word of God today. Today, our scripture reading comes from the gospel according to Luke chapter 24. Our scripture reading begins in verse 33, and it's going to continue through verse 53. And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. As they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones, as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate before them. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you. But stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Then he led them out as far as Bethany. And lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And we're continually in the temple blessing God. This is God's word. Thanks be to God. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for the gift of your gospel word. And I'm thankful for the testimony of the resurrection of your son, Jesus Christ. I pray that as you did for your disciples two millennia ago, that you would open our minds that we would understand your scriptures. 
I pray that in this Easter season that your Holy Spirit would clothe us with your resurrection life so that we would be empowered to declare your gospel and to display your gospel to our neighbors and to the nations. We pray this in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. What I just read was the final passage of the New Testament gospel according to Luke. We have been in and out of the gospel of Luke as a church family ever since the season of Advent in the year 2016. It's been a long journey, and this is the 84th and ending sermon of that long series. In this series, I I, I want to remind us why Luke wrote his gospel. Luke is writing his gospel, according to his own words, for a man named Theophilus. That name, Theophilus, literally means one who loves God. Many people um, conjecture that perhaps Theophilus is a Roman official or a wealthy Christian who just converted to belief in Jesus Christ. Whoever Theophilus might be, what Luke wants Theophilus to know and what he wants us as his readers to know is that we are to be a people that believe and trust in Jesus with great certainty. I want to read to you the very first words of the gospel according to Luke, which function as a type of thesis statement for his gospel. He says, Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things that you have been taught." You get the idea that Luke is adopting the posture of an investigative journalist. He wants us to know that the gospel of Jesus Christ does not belong in the genre of mythology. The gospel of Jesus Christ is a reality that is firmly fixed in human history. These are real events that happen to real people. The gospel of Jesus Christ is the story of the long-awaited Messiah who has come into the world. Jesus Christ came not with great wealth or privilege, but was born into a manger. He shows us in his life and his ministry that power does not lie in military strength or political might, but it's something that belongs to sacrificial acts of love and obedience to God. Luke shows us over and over again that God is a God of scandalous grace that chooses and works in and through the unlikely and the unworthy. Luke shows us a vision of the Son of Man who came to seek and save the lost. Jesus Christ conquers the world, not through military might or the power of the sword, but through a Roman cross where he dies for his enemies. But all of this, all of the the power who Jesus is hinges on one thing, and that is his resurrection. Without the resurrection of Jesus Christ, Jesus would be one of humanity's noble but very tragic figures that died a terrible death. But with the resurrection of Jesus Christ, he is nothing less than Lord and God. As we conclude the gospel according to Luke today, I want us to look at four truths that flow from believing in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And the first of those truths is point number one, the physicality of resurrection hope. The apostles are in a haze of confusion. In the last few days, they have been through an emotional roller coaster. Their hero, Jesus, was arrested, he was tried, he was condemned, and he was crucified until death on a Roman cross. This was not supposed to happen. All of their hopes about Jesus restoring the kingdom of Israel and the kingdom of God, those have been absolutely crushed. Everything that they have left their jobs and their homes for is all meaningless and pointless now. Then, three days later, everything changes. The tomb of Jesus is empty. People are beginning to claim that they have seen Jesus Christ alive, that he's even encountered and spoken with some of them. And as they are talking about these things behind locked doors, trying to verbally process all of this new information, Jesus Christ himself, the resurrected Lord, appears before them. They are shocked and overjoyed. There's a seeming mix of rejoicing and doubt because the disciples believe that this is too good to be true. They wonder, is this a waking dream? Are we seeing a ghost of Jesus? What is going on? But Jesus goes to great lengths to show them 
that he's not a ghost, that he's not a spirit, but that his resurrection is a very embodied and physical reality. Look back at our text beginning in verse 37. But they were startled and frightened and thought that they saw a spirit. And he said to them, why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate before them. What I hope you see in this account of Jesus' resurrection is that the physical, bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ was every bit as much outside of the paradigm of the disciples. It was outside of their plausibility construct as it is outside of ours. In fact, the people of the ancient world, I, I do believe, were a lot more intelligent and a lot more sophisticated than typically people in our age like to think. Most of us, I do think, have bought into this post-enlightenment narrative that think that our ancestors were a bunch of simple buffoons stumbling around in the dark. We are oftentimes guilty of what C.S. Lewis terms as chronological snobbery. But contrary to popular belief, people in the ancient world knew that when people die, they stay dead. So when the resurrected Jesus encounters his own apostles, they respond with doubt and disbelief. That that really is the, the gut level response to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It was that way in the ancient world and it is still that way today. For the last several centuries, there have been critical scholars that have tried to advance various theories that somewhat rationalize and sanitize this doctrine of the embodied resurrection of Jesus Christ. Some have suggested that the disciples simply stole the body of Jesus from the grave, that they buried it somewhere else, that they made up the story of the resurrection so that they could have their own religion and so that they could acquire power from that religion. But is that really reasonable to think? that these simple men from Galilee who had only traveled in and around the area of Palestine would take this message that they just made up and they would go and suffer for that message, that they would go and travel into the corners of the world to try to tell every person they knew about something that they had fabricated. Is it really reasonable to think that they would suffer and they would die for a falsehood? Now, I tend to agree with the French philosopher Blaise Pascal, who said, I tend to believe those witnesses that get their throat cut. Other critics argue for what is called the swoon theory. This is a theory that denies the resurrection of Jesus Christ because it denies that Jesus ever died on a cross. According to the proponents of this theory, Jesus, as he was on the cross, did not die. He merely fainted. He swooned on the cross. And the Roman soldiers were, were so simple-minded that they assumed that, that he was dead when, in fact, he was not. Now, I have to admit, even among uh, today's critical scholars, this is no longer a very popular view. Not because critical scholars believe in the resurrection, but it's because we now know so much more about the horror of the crucifixion. The crucifixion was a torturous form of death. This was not something that was easy to be able to survive. If you were crucified on a Roman cross, this was not something that you could walk away from and say, I'm not dead, I'm just very badly wounded. If the Romans were good at anything, it was very much putting people to death. So it takes great faith to believe that Jesus did not die on a cross. Another theory that's been advanced to rationalize the resurrection of Jesus is that the disciples somehow experienced a mass hallucination. See, they were in such great grief that they did not want Jesus to be dead. They, they were so committed to him and his teaching that they wanted it to not be true that he had truly died on the cross. And so they began to see a vision of Jesus somehow together. It was a mass form of psychosis. But this does not line up with what we see in the apostles as they're portrayed by the gospel accounts. For example, in John's gospel, we see one disciple, the apostle Thomas, and the other disciples have already witnessed the resurrection of Jesus. They've already seen Jesus and talked to him, and Thomas refuses to believe them. He says, unless I see Jesus embodied, unless I place my own hands inside of his wounds, I will not believe. In other words, 
The Apostle Thomas is a great example of what we might consider a modern scientist. He is demanding proof. And when he gets that proof, he doesn't just believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He acknowledges Jesus as both Lord and God. Today, probably the most popular form of rationalization of the resurrection of Jesus is simply to spiritualize it. According to this view, Jesus didn't literally rise from the dead, but he did so in a figurative way. His spirit lives on in those that embody Jesus' message. And while that might be attractive because it's a very intellectual and a very respectable form of belief of Christianity, it really is no Christianity at all. Because if we lose the resurrection of Jesus, we lose the very essence of the gospel. As American author John Updike once wrote, make no mistake, if he rose at all, it was as his body. If the cell's dissolution did not reverse, the molecule re-knit, the amino acids rekindle, the church will fall. The resurrection is not an expendable doctrine for the Christian. In fact, the New Testament explicitly teaches if we lose the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ, we lose the very foundation of our hope. As the Apostle Paul writes to the Corinthian church, And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then those who also have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. We are not a people to be pitied because we are not a people without hope. We are a people of unflinching and eternal hope because the resurrection of Jesus Christ is true. By every standard of historicity, few events in the ancient world are more attested than the resurrection of Jesus Christ. From just simply a standpoint of external evidence, there is more definitive and consistent testimony that Jesus Christ truly rose from the grave than the general Julius Caesar crossed the Rubicon. His resurrection was attested by no less than 500 eyewitnesses. The message of the resurrection was so powerful that it was, it was confirmed by supernatural signs and wonders all the way from Jerusalem to Rome. That by the end of the first century, more than a million people in various nations and languages called themselves Christian. And by the end of the fourth century, Christianity was the majority religion of the Roman Empire. That even in the Western world today, we still tell the time of history as it is split into two pieces because of God's intrusion into human history through the person, the work, the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Can we legitimately say that this is only the case because of conspiracy or hallucination or spiritualization? No. The only way we can explain this, the simplest way we can explain this, is that the resurrection of Jesus happened. And because the resurrection of Jesus happened, because the resurrection is true, Christians are invited to be a people of resurrection. As the Apostle Paul says to the Roman church, for if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. In the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we have witnessed nothing less than the very beginning of new creation. In other words, the resurrection doesn't just stop with Jesus. The power of Jesus' resurrection will one day restore our broken bodies and our broken world. One day, the power of resurrection will make all things new. Point number two, the plan of redemption. Once the disciples come to terms with the bodily resurrection of their Lord Jesus Christ, Jesus launches into that same mind-bending Sunday school lesson that he gave in last week's sermon. He shows them how all of Scripture ultimately is pointing them to him, what he's accomplished in his life, his death, and his resurrection. If we look back at our text beginning in verse 44, then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the Scriptures, and he said to them, thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day, rise from the dead. Now, this might go against the grain of what you've heard about the Bible. But the Bible is not best understood as a practical manual for life. Now, the Bible does include practical wisdom that is divinely inspired. 
But the Bible is primarily not human-centered. It is primarily God-centered. The Bible is God's self-revelation, his self-disclosure to us. If God really is infinite, if he is all-powerful and all-knowing and all-wise, then how is it possible for, for us as finite human creatures to ever come to a true knowledge of who he is? The truth is no human rationality, no human willpower, no human good works or morality are capable of bringing us into a redeeming knowledge of who God is. Now, the only way that we could ever know truth about God is for him to reveal himself to us. And in Scripture, that's exactly what he has done. The Bible reveals how God created the heavens and the earth and how he made the universe in a state of absolute perfection and harmony. He made man and woman as his image bearers to rule over and to steward God's good creation. But instead of stewarding God's creation, humanity rebelled. We chose to worship creation rather than our creator. We chose to define good and evil in self-reference rather than in reference to God. We brought sin and death into the world and we fractured God's creation. But instead of abandoning his creation to self-annihilation, God initiates this beautiful plan of redemption that he had planned from before the foundation of the world. Of all nations, he chooses this one nation named Israel, a nation of weak slaves, and he makes them his special people. He delivers them out of bondage, and he gives to them a promised land. He gives to them a kingdom, and then he sends them into exile because they reject his lordship. He restores them to their land, and he promises an even greater restoration that is yet to come. And all throughout the history of this nation, Israel, God is revealing his character and his nature. Through their history and through everything that has to do with them, their, their temple, their sacrifices, their prophets, their priests, and their kings, God is revealing himself to humanity. But ultimately, the law of Moses, the prophets, all of the writings are not going to bring us God's complete revelation. Instead, they are prefiguring and building the categories for God's ultimate revelation that's going to come not through principles that are taught, but through a person the Lord Jesus Christ. It is in Jesus Christ that we see the righteousness of God, the mercy of God, the justice of God, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. As the author of Hebrews states in its very beginning words, long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom he also created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. If this is true, that means that we cannot afford to see Jesus simply as a life coach or as a positive role model. Jesus cannot be seen as simply a good example or a moral teacher or a wonderful, wise philosopher. If this is true, Jesus cannot be a metaphor or a symbol of self-sacrificial love. Jesus is and forever will be the ultimate self-revelation of God himself. Jesus Christ is God. That all of life, all of history, that all of the cosmos are to be centered on him and all of our lives are to be centered on him as well. And if that is true, that means something else. It means that repentance and forgiveness of sin should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. In other words, belief in the gospel of God includes and demands participation in the mission of God. But we are not to go about that mission in our own strength. And that leads us to the next point. Point number three, the promise of the Father. As Jesus commissions his apostles for the ongoing mission of the church, he makes a profound promise. He says, you are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you. But stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. This promise of the Father is nothing less than the Holy Spirit of God. To be baptized and filled with the Holy Spirit of God. And in Luke's sequel to his gospel, the book of Acts, we are witnesses to the power of the Holy Spirit working in and through the early church. Now there's a lot to say about the Holy Spirit that can't be exhaustively explained in one point of one simple sermon. 
But suffice it to say, the Holy Spirit of God is not a force. He is God. He is co-equal with and co-eternal with God Almighty. He is a member of the divine trinity. He is the one who saves, sanctifies, and sends us as the church. He saves us by removing that veil of death that lies over our hearts so that we might see Jesus and behold him in faith. He is the one who, as he rose Jesus from the dead, also regenerates our souls. He renews our minds so that we might believe in the gospel and trust in Jesus. He also sanctifies us in that he applies to us all that Christ has accomplished. That he justifies us, adopts us, he cleanses us, and ultimately he will glorify us. But he also sends us. The Holy Spirit actively empowers the body of Christ to continue the mission of Jesus Christ. We are to declare and display the gospel, but we are not to do this in our own strength. We are to be a people that are forever dependent upon the Holy Spirit and empowered by the Holy Spirit. We have a mission, and that means that our lives have an eternally significant purpose. Point number four, the ongoing prayer ministry of Jesus. At the end of 40 days, wherein Jesus teaches and trains his disciples about the nature of the kingdom of God, it's time for him to return to heaven. Look at verse 50. And he led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple blessing God. Christians have called this very pivotal and major moment in the Gospels the ascension of Jesus Christ. Jesus ascends to the right hand of God. And in this ascension moment, he is enthroned. He has been exalted over all of his enemies, even death itself. Jesus is Christ the victor, the divine warrior who triumphs over all rival powers. What does Jesus Christ do with this authority that he has now been granted at the right hand of the Father? He prays. He prays for his people. He prays for you and for me. He continues the ministry on our behalf as our great high priest. As the Apostle Paul says in the book of Romans, who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God who indeed is interceding for us. Right now, in our time of global pandemic and economic turmoil, I can think of no greater hope than the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. And when we say we believe in the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ, what we are saying in that moment is in the same way that God rose Jesus Christ from the dead, that he is capable of bringing life out of our death. That we are saying that we believe that one day, What God did in Jesus, he's going to do in all of creation. We are believing in that moment that the same Holy Spirit that rose Jesus from the dead lives within us, that he moves in and through us. And we are saying that our resurrected Lord right now is at the right hand of the throne of the Father, interceding for and praying for you and for me. So Redeemer Christian Church in this Easter season, may we truly know the resurrection of Jesus Christ. May we believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And may we rest in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the gospel that you inspired to be written by Luke. Thank you that you have written this gospel so that we might have certainty concerning the things that we have been taught about Jesus. I pray that your gospel would be an unshakable foundation of hope in these very uncertain times. Lord, we continue to pray for the sick, for the weak, and for the vulnerable. Would you give them healing and protection? Lord, I pray that you would continue to empower our medical professionals and essential workers, that you would shield them and that you would strengthen them. Lord, we continue to pray for our workers and our businesses and those that have lost jobs and income. Would you grant them truly miraculous provision? Lord, we continue to pray for our governmental leaders and officials. Would you guide their hearts and minds with wisdom and compassion? Heavenly Father, we pray that you would break the power of this virus, that you would end this time of distancing so that we could get back to work, so that we can embrace one another in love. 
But until that day comes, help us to be good neighbors. Help us to find our peace in you and not in our circumstances. Help us to foster kindness and unity, not strife or division. May your Holy Spirit empower us to give glory to your name in the way that we give, in the way that we serve, in the way that we live our lives. Lord, would you sign and seal the words of your gospel deep within our hearts so that we might declare this gospel with our words and display this gospel with our lives to our neighbors and to the nations. We pray these things in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, our resurrected Lord. Amen. Amen. Let's worship the Lord. Oh,
the chasm that lay between us How high the mountains I could not climb In desperation I turned to heaven And spoke your name into the night And through the darkness Your loving kindness Tore through the shadows of my soul The work is finished The end is written Jesus Christ, my living hope Who could imagine so great a mercy What heart could fathom such boundless grace The God of ages stepped down from glory
benediction. May God raise you from death to life. May Christ Jesus cast out your fears and doubts. May the Holy Spirit give you a heart of joy in the midst of uncertainty. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen. We really do miss gathering together, but in this time, we hope that our ministry is able to be a blessing to you and to your family in this season. You can help us spread the gospel word by liking us on Facebook, sharing our posts, and, and liking our channel on YouTube. It really does help us stay connected to you in this season. And we also encourage you, if you're watching this on a Sunday morning, you are welcome to join us in our digital foyer. Um, you can click on the link below and connect to us right after service as we are able to just share a moment of fellowship with one another. We want to connect to you in the season. We want to serve you in the season. And we pray that our ministry can be a blessing to you. And so may the Lord bless and keep you as you go forth into this week. God bless.